Well, praise God. Praise God. You know, uh, a lot of us, uh, uh, if I were to say, how many of you are teachers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, the rest of you, you're also teaching. We all teach. You know that? We all teach. And the, and the reason I can say that because someone is looking and listening to your life. And they are gleaning whatever's going on with you. So the good stuff, they glean, and the not so good stuff, they say, thank you very much. <laughs> Only one of us needs to suffer that way, and it be you, <laughs> you know. But we, we're all teaching. We're all teaching. Of course, there's the gift of teaching. There's ministries of, of teaching. But I want us to uh, understand that today because what we impart to one another doesn't you know, happen in a classroom setting. We're constantly in connection with each other. We're, we're constantly um, enriching one another and, and, and teaching one another. We really are. And um, so that should really cause us to know that uh, you are very valued and important individual. You know, I said, well, I don't know. Why. No, God made you so uniquely special, important, and he's going to do and say things through you, and people are going to hear. There's more caught than taught. Can you get that? There's more caught than taught, and we pick up things all the time. And I'm sure we've all heard sayings like, like father, like son, like daughter, like mother, like daughter, chip off the old block, birds of a feather f flock together, etc., etc. What's the point? Similarity. The theme is similarity in all these things. In other words, if you see one, you're seeing the other as well. So this morning... If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, we're looking at a couple of portions of Scripture. Jesus is still in this first part of his second year. He's sending them out. They've gone out. We've looked at it. And then I'm imagining that this is kind of a debrief for them. In Luke 6 and in Matthew 10, those two portions of Scripture. But I just want to pray first. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you. Uh, we are um, very inadequate to uh, handle your word. But with your spirit in us, we can understand. We can uh, get a clue as to what you're saying and doing. So thank you for that uh, very special treasure, your, your spirit in each one of us. Teach us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So I want to apply uh, those themes, in other words, similarity, like I opened up with, to what Jesus says here. And it's evident, in, and you'll see in these portions of Scripture, these few verses, that Jesus' outcome, his desired outcome in what he's going to say in sending his disciples out on, on their first solo flight was that those to whom they ministered would realize that they're just like Jesus. See, that was the goal. And you'll see that in these verses. Beginning with Luke 6. Verse 40. Now we're going to come back to verse 39. But hear what he says in verse 40. Luke 6, verse 40. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. And then flip back quickly to Matthew 10, 
verses 24 and 25a. In other words, that's the first half of 25. And we'll get the second half. But here's what he says again. And, you know, here's what Luke is hearing. The Holy Spirit is speaking through Luke. Now hear how the Holy Spirit spoke through Matthew. Same scenario. Verse 24, Matthew 10. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become as his teacher and the slave as his master. So the content of these verses before us and the verses before and after, as we'll get to it, it's going to address some positive and negative things that result when disciples follow and identify with their teacher or master. So let's begin with the Luke passage. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Believers today do have a good emphasis on what we call discipleship. In most instances, however, it involves classes, DVDs, online courses, books, workbooks, and curriculums. Now, in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong. But all those mediums simply amount to a transference of information. This is what I want to get across. You're not getting the person. You're getting the person on the page, but you're not getting the person in vita, in life. You don't know their hurts, their thoughts, their life, their before and afters. I'm saying they're okay in and of themselves. But the best case scenario is that it's a transference of information. What's missing is the ability to become like one's teacher. That takes time. That takes humility. That takes personal contact. That takes commitment and contentment. Because you're going to see that in here. Especially when he says, it's enough that you become like your teacher. So let's look at a couple of phrases in this particular verse. Has been fully trained. The, the pupil or the disciple that has been fully trained, has been fully trained in English is just one Greek word. And translated it means perfected. Now the grammar here makes the word so powerful. And I was encouraged by one dear soul not to stop sharing what I'm going to share, the grammatical form. Because it's important for us to know God used words. <laughs> and he used words certain ways to mean certain things. This is and you've heard it before, a perfect passive verb. A perfect passive singular participle, mind you. What does that mean? It means the training, the influences, the input that began in the past is bearing fruit and evidence in the present with the assured outcome that it will continue in that individual, because this is a singular, in that individual's life on into the future. That's what God chose, to use that word. And we use four words to try and understand one of God's words here. So fully trained means that you get it, <laughs> in layman's terms. It means that it becomes your lifestyle, not just a point of info. It defines you, just like it defines the one who taught you. Okay? Fully trained. 
means what you've picked up in the past is bearing fruit now. It's helped you. It's changed you. It moves you. And that's who I am now. You know, when Jesus changes our life, it's not like putting a little salt on something to make it taste better. We don't sprinkle a little Jesus on our head. We're changed. It, it's new. We're new creatures. We're new creations. It's an inside-out job. It's our lifestyle. See, sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes somebody might say, uh, oh, you always got to use the Bible. Uh, you always talk in Scripture. Yeah. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> hey? Are you Mr. or Miss Worldly Wise Person? Yeah? See what I'm saying? Maybe that's that person's lifestyle. Maybe they'd rather think God's thoughts than their own. Because their own has gotten them where they are or were. Right? Why? That didn't work. So to be fully trained means what I heard has affected me, changed me, influenced me in such a way that this is who I am now. And who I am, it, the only thing is it may be getting even better, but it's going to go on into the future. See? Into the future. The other phrase is, in this verse, will be like his teacher. And I already said that, that the intended outcome that God has for anyone who teaches is that the students become like the teacher. And you go, well, I don't want them to become like me. Just learn your lesson. <laughs> Live your own life. I got issues. You know? Uh, bring it on. Let me see the real person. Let me not just hear. You know, I could Google information. <laughs> but I can't Google your life. <laughs> so we'll be like his teacher Again, this is a grammar tells the story. Like and as in English, we call them similes. Hmm? Remember that from, from uh, English class? What are those? Those are words that set up comparisons. They bring to mind images, descriptions, and associations to understand the intent of the writer. Do you know Jesus' kingdom purposes were to help the disciples understand that at the end of the road, at the end of the three years, at the end of everything that they had been taught and trained and saw, that they would identify it with it in the same manner as he did it, as if he were there doing it. That's what Jesus wants out of anyone who's called a Christian. If you're called a Christian, what does that mean? Then I'm like Christ. I'm not Christ, but I'm like Christ. That means there should be some things in my attitudes, my words, my thoughts, my actions that look like Jesus, sound like Jesus. See? That's just normal stuff. Normal stuff. Remember those two guys at the at the end of the story, the, the two disciples were on the road to Emmaus. You know, they were all down in the mouth, you know. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus got crucified, and it's the third day. He didn't rise from the grave. They didn't see it, of course. You know, those two disciples on the road to Emmaus were distraught because they had the wrong idea. And even though they had spiritual heartburn, remember they had spiritual heartburn? 
when they heard Jesus explaining the scriptures, you know a lot of us get spiritual heartburn, meaning we love hearing the word. I love hearing the word. I love hearing worship. I love hearing the word. But they didn't recognize Jesus when he was teaching, when he explained all that. Remember? They didn't recognize him. Not until he broke the bread. You know why? That's because when he fed the multitudes, which we didn't talk about yet, they beheld, they received and saw him break the bread. Guess what? Their eyes were opened then. Their eyes were opened because they saw their master. They beheld what he did and they received it. But he's teaching them about the scripture and man, there he's teaching them a boatload of stuff. Listen to how it reads, Luke 24. And it came about that when he had reclined at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it. You and I are like bread that God will break. And he will give you away. And they saw this happening. And there was probably a whole lot of commentary going on with them and Jesus during those days. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him because their teacher demonstrated grace and love and all these things. And they Got it, you see? They didn't get all the Bible lesson because they were sad. They were preoccupied with that the kingdom didn't happen yet. Oh, we thought he was the one. Whew, 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 swirling. But when he broke the bread, see? That was something. At least that. At least that. In that area, they experienced, you know what? Full training. See? They were fully trained in that thing. I believe that the word is living and active. And all you have to do is hear one word. And if you receive it, it will change you. It'll do things in your life. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. How many truths do you think you need to be set free? <laughs> Just one. Just one. And one of the greatest is I died for you. <laughs> I died for you. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we don't have, you know, they say that uh, your attention span, you know what the attention span is? The last I heard, about four seconds. <laughs> That's why you get bored with a commercial that's like 15 seconds and God forbid the 30 second one. When is this thing going to quit? Gee. Yeah. Let's move on to the next similar passage. Go to Matthew 10, 24 and 25. He says the same thing. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It takes a boatload of grace 
for disciples to not consider themselves superior and advanced because they are youthful and may have additional or supposed up-to-date information. How many of you a little older have heard, you're old school? <laughs> you're old school. That's old news. You know the danger? I mean, it's true. Hey, praise God. I, I did seminary with a Smith Corona portable typewriter. That's old school. That's Stone Age almost. And, you know, the, okay, praise God for, you know, innovation and modernization, etc. Praise God. But the danger is, I don't have anything to learn from you, because you're old news. That's a danger. That's a danger. Did you know that God has put each teacher? What's a teacher? Well, you know, a pastor, a counselor, an educator, a coach. I mean, there's lots of teachers. And each master, what's a master? Today, in an economic standpoint, it would be an employer or any positional authority. God has put each teacher and master into our lives. You know why? To add to who we are. It's like God saying, I have a toolbox that I want to fill up for you. And you need this person, and you need this person, and you need this story, and you need this testimony, and you need this life experience, and you need to bear the yoke here, and you need to learn the hard way here, and you're going to be blessed here, and it's all coming from people and life experiences. It's all good. As I said earlier, there's a lot of ways that we can get information, right? Just Google it. We can get information. And I'm, I'm still amazed. I don't know how that works. Matter of fact, one of the things that really still caused me to be in awe is when I go to Google Maps and I don't know where I am. And I say, but I know the address where I'm going. And I put that address in, and I say, directions. And then a little green button comes up that says, go. And then, <laughs> and if my wife's not looking, then, no. <laughs> then I push go. It knows every street. It knows make this left turn, go here, go there. And, it, and if you make the wrong turn, it says, correction, correct, <laughs> you know. Correct your course. Make a U-turn. <laughs> hey, okay. We use, it. we use it for good. I'm amazed. But the danger, the danger is that people, not books, not machines, etc. They, people, are unique. People are unique individuals to whom God wants to improve you, develop you, deepen you, and enrich you. That'll never happen if we're just looking for information and disregarding the persons God has given you to discover. Don't be impatient with who God has in your life. Learn them. Learn them. Figure them out. It'll improve and enrich your own life. 25a goes on. It is enough for the disciple that he become as his teacher and the slave as his master. So let's look at it is enough. Again, this is one word, and it means this. It's enough. <laughs> it means it's sufficient. Here's what it's really saying. Be content. Be content. I remember someone a long time ago who was thinking, who was thinking that 
they couldn't quite learn very much from their spouse because they happen to be, um, you know, they grew up in circumstances where they were more informed in terms of biblical knowledge, things like that. And I said to this individual, I said, uh, well, do you read the word together? Yeah, we read the word together. I go, okay. Uh, and does your spouse have a comment? And they said, yeah. But it's not that deep spiritual message I want out of it. It's just kind of a, everybody can see that. I said, that's where you need to have a banquet on that crumb. <laughs> you need to learn how to have a banquet on that crumb. You hear what I'm saying? Because you'll be learning the individual. You'll be giving that person worth. You'll, you'll know that I'm content with just being together. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's enough. It's enough. You don't have to become super Bible knowledge person. You have a devotion at home or you, you read the word together. You, you, you don't, it doesn't have to become a big preaching session. Just let the word speak to you. Let God speak to you, okay? It is enough. You know why? Because it's the process of learning. And you know what the process of learning is? Practice. Practice. Listen to what Paul said to the Philippian believers in Philippians 4.9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace shall be with you. Now, he's not saying, hey, the God of peace. You know how powerful the God of peace is? In Romans 16, Paul says to the Roman believers, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Do you, you hear that? See, the God of peace, in other words, you can't rock my boat. This trial has come into my life, but the God of peace has my back. He has got it handled. And the things, the doubts, the fears, all those things that the enemy, that's his ammo. His ammo is deceit, fear, doubt that want to rage up the God of peace says, I'm crushing that. I'm crushing that. Yeah. You see, this is where books and curriculum fail. God never intended you to become like a book, a DVD series, or a self-help curriculum. Here's what it's about. Person-to-person -person impartation. That's what it's about. Person-to-person -person impartation. And, you know, we have used DVD series around here, and I'm amazed how the Holy Spirit seems to just come right through the screen <laughs> and speak through whom, whatever series we're using. And it could have been done a couple of years ago. But there's no person-to-person -person impartation there with the with the real time, you see. That's even better. That's even better. Now, Jesus is going to, in the context now, let's go to the other verses, back to Luke 6, and we'll pick up at verse 39. He's going to share two negative outcomes. He says this, He also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? And without being overly simplistic, physical blindness is the inability to see, to behold, 
and to picture physical things. Now, Jesus and the Holy Spirit usually, usually does this. He uses a known condition to illustrate a spiritual reality. What's the spiritual reality? People who are blind to the truth, who don't know who they're talking about or what they're talking about, are unable to lead anyone to the truth. That's the blind leading the blind. Jesus gets graphic here with this word pit. They fall into a pit. That's a term for a man-made cistern, okay, like a cesspool. Uh, let me add my graphics. They fall into a quarry of deception, a trench of visionless activity, a swirling quagmire or swamp of sticky situations and false hopes. That's what happens when the blind lead the blind. And the problem is that innocent people fall right in there with them. You know, if you're a good salesperson, you can sell somebody something that they don't need <laughs> or that isn't what it's all, you know, meant to be or looks like, etc. And you have to be discerning. People have to be discerning. Go to the Matthew passage. He's going to use a, a, a different kind of outcome. So one outcome is the blind cannot lead the blind. But in Matthew 10, 25, and that's part B now, if they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? You see, when a believer goes from a learner to an identified doer, as soon as you begin practicing and doing, that person becomes a threat to the devil also becomes a threat to this world system. Immediately, the diversions and the accusations begin. Motives are challenged. Uh, false accusations are made just because you're applying, you're doing the things that God has written in your heart. In Mark 3.22, it says the scribes and the Pharisees who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebub, and he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. Oh, he can't do that uh, healing on a... He's breaking the Sabbath. Who does he think he is? Even calling God his own father. Imagine that. See, the accusations come. Jesus will remind them, and this is where the road gets a little tough for a believer. He reminds them and prepares them and strengthens them in the upper room just before he's arrested of these kinds of assaults. He says in John 15, beginning of verse 17, this I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. You see, he's doing this at the beginning of the ministry. He's doing it just before he gets arrested. He's saying the same thing. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So I praise God. Let's close with some of the realities of discipleship that we see in these verses and just in general. True disciples, true disciples, then and now, you ready? are not gained by marketing strategies, okay? They're not gained by prosperity mantras. They're not gained by personality-driven ministries for contemporary relevance. Those ministries characterized as power ministries, emphasizing miracles, signs, and wonders, 
have an appeal drawing people, but unfortunately, they develop a temporary satisfaction that seems always needing to be refueled or revisioned or re-revivaled. Do you know something? Truth attracts. There's never a need to market the truth. Why? Because true disciples recognize and respond to God's presence. That's why. We were made for God. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We are spirits. God has designed our spirit to know him and enjoy him. True disciples recognize the presence of God. They are attracted to the truth. When Jesus first started calling his disciples, if you remember Andrew and John, John the baptizer said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now how did he know that? Because the Holy Spirit had told him, the person you see the Holy Spirit, I mean, uh, God the Father told him, the person you see the Spirit come and descend and, and remain on him, he's the one. So John says, behold, those guys were following John. And as soon as John said that, guess what they did? They identified with John's Spirit recognition that this is the Savior. And what they do? They left John, and they went. Jesus saw them coming, and he said, what do you seek? <laughs> what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Not Rabbi, tell us a story. Where are you staying? And what did Jesus say? Come and see. That was about 10 in the morning, Roman time. It says they stayed the whole day. The day was over in general at, at sundown, so we'll call it 6 o'clock. From 10 a.m. to 6 o'clock, that's eight hours. Eight hours with Jesus. What do you think went on? What do you think went on? I think they were wowed beyond just to see the man, to hear probably some kingdom glories. Probably their own hearts were revealed. <laughs> because when they left Jesus, you know what happened next? <laughs> they ran to their brothers. We found him! <laughs> see? We found him, who everybody was writing about. We found him. Yeah, that's what happens when you spend time with Jesus. That's what happens. They call him rabbi. When you're with a teacher, I'm going to give you six points here. Here's, here's the scenario that builds true discipleship. When you're with a teacher... You need to be willing to submit. They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? When they said Rabbi, that meant that they were willing to submit if he would have them. Okay? I'll never learn anything from anyone if I set myself up as an equal or better than, and let's see if you can teach me anything. I love what my dad used to say. Even a wise man can learn from a fool. <laughs> I wonder if he was talking about me. <laughs> Can't figure that out yet. He's with the Lord now. The second point is they thrive in relationship. They're looking for relationship. Jesus invited them to spend the day with him. And no doubt, as I said, he told them of his mission, maybe even revealed their hearts and answered their questions. 
In other words, that day wasn't just attending a class. It was beginning a relationship with Messiah Jesus. Third, they themselves are an irrefutable witness of a changed life. Immediately, they were different. And they were going to, Messiah's here. We've heard him. We know him. Their authenticity was verified through their words, their thoughts, their actions, their attitudes. If I'm being discipled by somebody and all it is is a bunch of knowledge, that's all I got. I got a bunch of knowledge. But I'm still me. You know what? I have made it a life goal to learn the people in my life, especially those who I learn from. I want to learn them. I want to, I want to be taught by them. I mean, we're not walking around the countryside. Our economy, our lifestyles, things are different. But I have got to pause somewhere to learn the, my teacher, to learn the people in your life, like spouses. Learn each other. Kids, learn your parents, so on and so forth. Listen to what the uh, situation we looked at weeks ago in Luke 5. Jesus said to Peter, Do not fear. From now on you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. They were changed. Paul said to the Thessalonian believers, You turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. How many things are still in your and my life that's got us like this? I can't let go of. Is it something physical? Is it something emotional? Is it some, I mean, what is it? Is it an attitude issue? Is it an action? Is it my thoughts? What, what can I let go of? I need to turn from that to serve God. And I'm telling you, you don't miss out on life. Actually, life begins to unfold. True life does. Fourth, they, they rejoice when they see people pursuing God and his living words and faithful examples. That's why we need to keep doing this. Come to church Go to Bible studies. Be involved in fellowship. It's our life. Fellowship. Talking about God and talking about God in your and my life. We need it. Again, the Thessalonian believers. Paul was so jazzed with these guys. He only ministered to them for a couple of months, maybe eight weeks and here's what he says about them in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. We constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what, for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. How do I know that that's the word of God? Because it does what he sent it to do. You see? For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus. Wow, when we're in a, a disciple, a teacher, student, discipler, disciple relationship, we rejoice as we see God working in one another's lives. We really do. Fifth, they're humble ministers of reconciliation. A true disciple wants to see other people healed, other people saved, other people coming into the truth just like they have. And it begins with repentance. But look, look, re repentance is not <laughs> the wringing of the hands, you know, oh, God. Yeah, for some people that, that has happened. But you know what repentance is? 
It's a change in your soul. It's a change in the way you think. It's a change in the way you decide things. It's a change in the way you feel about things. It's a soul change, a transformation there. And it's not just a change because you got caught. Uh-oh, my number's up. You know what? I mean, God is incredible. He sees what we do, and he loves us anyway. <laughs> he sees what we do, and he says, I'll heal you anyway. Such a loving father. As you become, you remember, remember, uh, step on the crack, break your mother's back. <laughs> remember that one? <laughs> Boy, that was terrible. <laughs> Who wants to break their mother's back? You know, come on. As you become. And as we become true disciples, where we're loving fellowship, where we're, we're submitted, where, where our lives are changing, you will recognize something that goes on in your, for your life, for your life, when we don't uh, get with it. You'll recognize God's grief over your unruliness. Listen to Jeremiah 13, 17. Now, Jeremiah is speaking for the Lord. Okay? He's a prophet of God. Listen, 13, 17. If you will not listen or obey, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock, and of course he's talking to Israel at that time, that they're going to be taken into captivity. But when you personalize this, it says, because you have been taken captive. In Proverbs 1, you see a picture of God who's saying, all day long I have held my hands out to you. He says, turn to me, turn to my attention getter, and I will pour out my spirit on you. I'll make my words known to you. But when we are unruly and we don't listen, it's like God is going in the... A true disciple sees that picture. See? Just don't pass it off. Oh, well, proper hermeneutics is that that's the, the, uh, the prophet speaking to Israel. Who is that guy, Herman Nudix, anyway? <laughs> Here's the last point, we'll close. True disciples engage, I, I made up a term, okay? True disciples engage what I'm going to call triune training. Triune training. That's this. They rest in the love of God. They grow in the grace of Christ Jesus and they fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Rest, grace, and fellowship. Rest, grace, and fellowship. I'm asking you today to choose one of those three things. Choose one of those three teachers or masters this week. Spend time developing that relationship. In other words, if you're going to do rest in the love of God, the Father, then just think about how much you're loved. Think, think about his patience, his waiting, his, just all that he has that he wants to pour out on you. If you want to spend time with the grace of the Lord Jesus, he, he, he is, without him, you can do nothing. I can do nothing. I don't know how to live without you, Lord. And, and plug that thought, I need your grace in every situation. 
If it's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, then don't, just don't read the word and go, hmm, 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 hmm. It's the anointing of the Spirit helping you understand. Enjoy his presence. John said in John 1, 16, of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. God desires us to learn and to be like his triunity. Do you know that? He wants us to love. He wants us to walk in grace. And he wants the fellowship. My desire this week, and it's been for a couple of weeks, is to learn to be like the Holy Spirit. So what's that look like? I'll tell you. It's realizing his manifest presence. It's knowing that love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control are not character qualities. They are the presence of the Holy Spirit himself. It's learning how he comforts. It's learning how he helps. It's learning how to illuminate truth. It's fellowship with him and gaining wisdom and insight and understanding. But most of all, it's to grasp that giving glory and praise to Jesus is the Holy Spirit's greatest joy. You know the Holy Spirit's greatest joy is not some spiritual gift. It's not some kind of gifting of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's greatest joy is Jesus Christ. That's his greatest joy. So that's what I'm going to work on this week. I've been working on it. And I pray that uh, you would think about they rest in the love of the Father. They grow in the grace of Christ Jesus. And they fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God desires us to do all three. Maybe you could work on one of those this week. And if we can remember seven days from now, we could share some testimonies about it. Amen. How about that? Let's stand. We're all teachers. We're all teachers. And we're all learners. But if God has put someone in your life who you can be mentored by, they don't need a title. They don't need a, you know, they're just a person that you want to learn from. Or if you go to an actual class, as it were, then have the attitude that you're willing to hear God through these people, through that person. For his glory and for your good. Because those persons will be part of your toolbox in life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these wonderful people. Thank you that we can share together. Lord, I trust that your spirit uh, has made sense of these things that we've talked about, I've talked about, patiently listening, my dear friends and brothers and sisters in you. Lord, let us be doers and not hearers only. Lord, let us really deepen our relationship with one another and provide those opportunities where that can happen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. We trust you. And may we go from here to be the people you have changed us to be. We ask it in your name. Love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Have a great day in the Lord.